Hi, and welcome to Roswell United Methodist Church. My name is Michael Cromwell, and I have the joy of serving as one of the associate pastors here at RUMC. Thanks for joining us for our on-demand version of the sermon, which will be delivered later today. If you'd like to watch our services live, you can do so via our live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15. Notice our different worship times and our different hours that we have now. You'll also be able to see the entire worship service service on demand later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. We are so glad that you are with us today. We're thankful for your presence and we're thankful for your generosity and the different ways that you are helping to make RUMC a place of community and faith. Let's have a word of prayer before we hear our sermon. Gracious and loving God, we love you so much and we are grateful for this day and this day that we have to worship you. May the words that we are to hear, may they not only pierce our ears, but pierce our hearts as well, that we might be changed in different people because of what you have to say to us today. We thank you and we love you all in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now let's hear our sermon from today. This morning, I'll be reading from the book of Hebrews, which is a small book in the, the back of the, the Bible in the New Testament. And I'll be reading Hebrews chapter 11, verses 23 through 25. And this is what it says. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents because they saw he was a beautiful child and they were not afraid of the king's edict. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter choosing rather to endure ill treatment with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. Join with me in prayer. Lord, time, it may be among the most valuable resources that you, you've given us, and may we never take it for granted. Thank you for this time and for your presence here. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Anyone who's been an Atlanta Braves fan for any period of time at all knows the name Brett Butler. Brett Butler was brought up in the Braves minor league system, and, and when he made it to the big leagues, he showed incredible promise. And so the Braves did what they often did during that time. They traded him to another team where he became a superstar. <laughs> well, Brett Butler was not what most folks would have, have thought would have been a, a superstar because he was 5'9 and 156 pounds. When he graduated from high school, there was not one Division I college that offered him a college scholarship. So he went to play for a small college, went to play baseball for an NAIA school, and twice he was college All-American there. But when he told his coach that he wanted to try out for the big leagues, his coach told him that he would never make it, that he was too small. Well, he was drafted. He was drafted by the Atlanta Braves farm system. He was drafted in the 23rd round. Now, anyone drafted in the 23rd round would consider themselves very fortunate to play one season in the major leagues. But Brett Butler not only played one season, he played 16 seasons in the major leagues. And 12, he didn't just play and just get by. 12 of those seasons, he stole over 30 bases or more. That stealing 20 bases in a season is considered a, mile, a major milestone, but he stole over 30 bases or more in 12 seasons. Many people would consider Brett Butler the best leadoff hitter ever in baseball. One of the best bunters, if not the best bunter in baseball. But definitely an underdog, not what folks would have expected. And whenever he talks about his, his under, underdog story, he, he mentions words like commitment. He mentions words like tenacity. He mentions words like, like passion. But he also mentions words like mom and dad. That his mother, his father, that they were there encouraging him. They were there cheering him on. They were there with him every step of the way. Now, I love those underdog stories. Don't you love those underdog stories? 
I, underdog stories are, are wonderful. And in Jesus' day, they told underdog stories. They weren't Brett Butler stories. They were Moses stories. For over 400 years, the Jews told Moses stories as an, an, an underdog story. Moses was born a slave. And you don't get much more underdog than being born a slave. He was born a slave at a time when Pharaoh had set out an edict that the midwives should kill all the Hebrew babies when they were born. Well, the Bible tells us that the midwives feared God more than they feared Moses, so they didn't do it. Excuse me, more than they feared Pharaoh, so they didn't do it. And so when Pharaoh called the midwives to him and said, well, why are there still so many boy babies alive here in, in Egypt? that the midwives said, well, these Hebrew women, that they're so strong that they've already delivered the babies before we get there. So he sent out a second edict to the midwives that all the boy babies should be thrown in the Nile River as soon as they're born. Well, it was Moses' mother, Jochebed, who didn't obey the king's edict or the Pharaoh's edict. Instead, she built for him a, a basket made out of reeds, and she covered it with tar, a little boat, really. And she put him down in the Nile, waiting for the time when Pharaoh's daughter would come down to take a bath. And there, maybe, just maybe, Pharaoh's daughter would see Moses and take him as her own child. And as the plan began to unfold, maybe Pharaoh's daughter, when she saw him, would need a nurse. And secretly, Jochebed, Pharaoh's real mother, could be his nurse and grow up with or help him grow up, even though he was in Pharaoh's palace and not her own home. Well, that's what happened. And so here it tells us in the verses we read this morning that when, when Moses became an adult, he chose not the mother that, that gave him the palace, not the mother that gave him the power, not the mother that gave him the prestige, not Pharaoh's daughter, that he chose Jochebed, the mother that, that gave him the things that mattered most. And that's what I want to talk about this morning, the things that matter most, the things that matter most. And the first thing that Jochebed gave Moses, the first thing that she gave him was time. Time. It might be a little bit of a surprise when I say time is among the things that matter most. I think my, my understanding of time began to change some in Philip Zimbardo's book, Time Paradox. That in that book, he said that the word time is the, the noun most used in the English language. Of all the words in the English language, the word time and things associated with time, that's the word, the noun, most used. Began to look that up and in the Bible. It turns out every single book of the Bible mentions the word time. And that we use language, language to voice what we value most. The words that we use most are the things that we value most. Some people will say, well, no, money, money. People value money. Yes, but they'll pay great sums of money in order to save just a little bit of time. We call it fast food, not because it's so delicious. It's because it saves a little bit of time. People pay money to drive in the Peach Pass lane. Well, it's not because they just like it because it's nice. No, it saves time. People will pay a lot of money to help with yards, with help with houses, to help with family, because it saves time. Time. Time is among the things that we value most. And, and if people are to know that they're loved, the expression of love is most often expressed in time. It's most often experienced in time as well. That love is most expressed and most experienced in the time. Yes, 
the time that we give to a child, like, like Jochebed gave her life to Moses, gave her time to Moses, or a grandchild. The time we give to a, a husband, a wife. The time that we give to God. The time is the currency. The currency that we give that shows what we value most. During the pandemic, we've been given an opportunity. An opportunity to look at time in a different way. And now that the pandemic's coming to a close, it may be that you have an opportunity to reflect back over this past year. To see how the, the, your time, time was offered to children. Time offered to a husband, to a wife. Time offered to God. And it's an opportunity that, that maybe we look at time brand new. In a brand new way. In a fresh way. That going into this, this coming year that we see just how we offer our time to God and to others. It's among the things that, that matter most. It's, it's the way that we express love and it's the way we experience love. Through time. Through time given. Through time offered. But that's not all I want to talk about this morning. The things that matter most, yes. I wanted to talk about time, but also sacrificial love. This year, Georgians lost one of the most deeply loved, deeply respected citizens. Hank Aaron died this year. And you don't have to be a baseball fan to know that, that uh, Hank Aaron, he, was a, he broke Babe Ruth's home run record. Babe Ruth's record held for 40 years. And in 1973, everybody thought that was going to be the year that Hank Aaron would break Babe Ruth's record. That year, Hank Aaron received over 930,000 pieces of mail. The vast majority of, of that mail was, was positive. But about 100,000 pieces of that mail, that it was hate mail. And among the hate mail was mail that contained death threats to Hank Aaron and to his family. Well, it was a tumultuous time that there are people that the thought of an African-American breaking Babe Ruth's record was more than, than they thought they could take. And so people kind of held their breath during that time, especially when 1973, at the end of the season, all he had to do was hit one more home run to break Babe Ruth's record. Well, he tied Babe Ruth's record in 1973. It wasn't until opening day in 1974 that Hank Aaron broke Babe Ruth's record. He was rounding the bases, and I don't know if you've seen video or you remember, the two young men jumped out of the, the crowd at the stadium, jumped over the fence, and they be, began to run onto the field, and they began to, to, to follow Hank Aaron around the bases. Well, nobody was real sure what was going to happen until they began to pat him on the back and congratulate him. That was shortly before security tackled them and hauled them off to jail. And then Hank Aaron came around third base, and the whole dugout of the, of the Braves team had emptied onto the field. There gathered around the plate was the, the whole team of the Atlanta Braves plus one, Hank Aaron's mother. When he crossed the plate, she grabbed hold of his arm, and he looked down at her, and he said, Mama, what are you doing here? She said, Baby, if they're going to get you, they got to get me first. <laughs> That's sacrificial love. Sacrificial love. It's not what's easiest. Sacrificial love. It's not what's co most convenient. Sacrificial love is what's best for the other person. That's the kind of love that, that Jochebed had for Moses. It certainly wasn't easiest thing to do to give up her, her life, to go into to Pharaoh's palace, to risk her life to go into Pharaoh's palace. That wasn't most convenient thing, but it was what was best for Moses. 
sacrificial love. It's among the most important things and it's sacrificial love that Jesus gave for, for you and for me. Not because dying on the cross was the easiest thing for him or most convenient thing for him, but his sacrificial love of giving his life on the cross for you and for me, that was what we needed. And it's what we need this day. That on the cross, Jesus took all those things that would conquer us, all those things that would defeat us, all those things that would grind us down, the fear. He took it. The sin. He took it. The shame. Jesus took all that on himself and he nailed it to the cross to kill it, to take away its power once and for all. And when he rose from the grave, he gave power to you and to me. A power to overcome fear. A supernatural power to overcome sin. To overcome shame. And that's the, the sacrificial love that Jesus gave you and gave me. It's a love that does what's best for the other. It's among the things that matter most. It's among the things that matter most. And that's what Jacobed gave, time. Sacrificial love. And the last thing that I want to talk about this morning is that Jacobed gave to Moses a heart for God. A heart for God. Walter Wangren talks about a time in his life where he had what he calls a, a crisis of faith. He was a, a small boy and he was certain that everybody in his church could see Jesus except for him. So one day after church, he made his way up into the pulpit. He looked into the pulpit because he was certain that Jesus must be there, but that's not where Jesus was. One day during the week, he was with his mother, and he was walking down the hall in church. He was certain that, that maybe if Jesus was in the pastor's office, he stuck his head in there, and Jesus wasn't there. He stuck his head in one of the classrooms, and Jesus wasn't there. It wasn't until one of the morning services where he was sitting there with his mother. They were serving communion, and Walter Rangwin turned to his mother and said, Mama, I need to go to the restroom. She said, Okay, but Hurry. Well, he made his way to the restroom, but not to the boys' restroom. He went to the one place that he hadn't checked, the ladies' restroom. He stuck his head to see if Jesus was in there, but Jesus wasn't in the ladies' restroom. When he was making his way back to sit with his mother, he saw on her face a look of, of joy and peace. And so when he got in the pew next to her, he said, Mama, what is it? She said, Shh, Walter. And that's when he got close and he, he smelled on her breath something that he hadn't smelled before. And he said, Mama, what is it? That's when she realized what he was asking. His mother had taken communion. And so she told Walter, she said, well, that's Jesus in me. And for most of us, the first time that we ever saw Jesus was Jesus in Mama. Or maybe it was Jesus in Dad. Or maybe the first time that we, we saw Jesus, it was Jesus in a grandmother or a grandfather. Someone that, that let us know that you matter to God. And so you mattered to them as well. I grew up in a large church. And I remember I was about five or six years old and Miss Tumlin was the one that had volunteered to be the choir director for the children. Now, from the time I was about five or six years old, every time I saw Miss Tumlin, all the way up until I was an adult, Miss Tumlin, Miss Tumlin would say, I pray for you. And you know what? I know she did. I'm certain she did. Mr. Wilson, he was one of the ushers. He was older than my father. But every time I saw Mr. Wilson, he would bend over, and he would stick out his hand, and he'd say, Hi there, boy. Shake hands with an honest man. And I would just giggle and laugh, but he showed me how to shake hands. He showed me that I mattered to God and that I mattered to him as well. It was people like Ms. Brownlow. 
It was people like the Englands who volunteered to, volunteered to be counselors for the middle school youth. Well, my class had a lot of knot-headed boys in it, and they were all in the youth group, and I know that couldn't have been the easiest thing ever, but that's what they did. It was folks like Mr. Dosser. He insisted that we call him G-Daddy or Granddaddy. G-Daddy Dosser. He cooked breakfast for us on Tuesday mornings before we, the, the youth director gave us a, a, a devotion and we went on to school when we were in high school. That in order to know that we matter to God, we see it first in the life of another. Every time I do a baptism, you'll hear me say something like that faith is more caught than taught. Well, I'm going to do my best to teach it, to make sure folks know that, 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 that this Christian faith, we embrace one fact, and that's Jesus rose from the, the grave. We embrace one doctrine, and that doctrine is the doctrine of redemption, that what Jesus did on the cross, that it was enough for you and for me. But as, as, as hard as, a, as I'm going to try to teach, that I know, I know, faith is, is more caught than taught. And if they're going to catch it, they're gonna, faith is going to be, be caught from people like you. People who take time to let children, children, grandchildren, or child of God, know that they matter to God and they matter to you. This morning, I want to offer a, an invitation, a challenge really, that this week, this week, you spend time Time. It's among the things that, that matter most, that you spend time praying for a child, a grandchild, or a child of God, but that right now that you have that, that name come to mind. If you spend time in prayer, your attitude toward that child, it'll make all the difference in the world to that child and to you. It might be a child in your family or it might be a child in the neighborhood. It might be a child that, well, you don't know who it is right now, but if you start praying, I'm certain, I'm certain that sometime during this week that child will come to mind. And that you pray that that child have a, a heart for God and they catch it and that in some small small way that that you take part because a heart for God it's among the things that matter most time time for God it's among the things that matter most and sacrificial love it's among the things that matter most pray with me Lord the easy part is Standing up and saying what we'll do, what we think. But what we will do isn't what we do often. What we think isn't, isn't the way we live often. Lord, I ask for your strength this day. Strength enough that we might offer our time invested in the life of another, invested in you, a time invested where we take into mind, into heart, the life of another, and we let them know that they matter to God and that they matter to us, whether it's a child, a grandchild, or a child of God. Lord, may this day be the first step in a world that begins to know who you are and that you ushered in a new kingdom through Jesus Christ and you 
you're ushering that new kingdom in this day. Lord, use us. Use us. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thanks again for joining us today. Um, just a reminder, if you'd like to watch the entire worship service, you can do so via live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15 a.m. You can also view the service on demand a little bit later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. Also, if you have any prayer requests, we would love to hear about those. You can send those in to pray at rumc.com. Also, if you'd like to give of your tithes and your offerings, you can do that online as well. And that's at rumc.com slash giving. Uh, thanks again for joining us today and for honoring God with your presence. We hope and pray that you have a wonderful week and we look forward to seeing you again next week. My name's Tom Davis. I'm senior pastor here at Roswell United Methodist Church. Thank you for joining us this morning. We're a church that's a place of community and faith and we're a welcoming church. I hope that you experience that online, but not only online, my hope is that you experience it through our Facebook page. But not only that, once we meet together in person, we're at 814 Mimosa Boulevard and I hope you'll come and experience it in person. We're a welcoming church. We're a biblical church. And we're a compassionate church. It's a place of community and faith where we help people live a Christ-centered life. And my hope is that you'll come and be a part of it. Thank you for joining us. <music>